Hi, my name is Dragan. I'm a psychotherapist and the bulk of the work I do is in the field of complex trauma and gender diversity. I myself identify as a non-binary transgender man and today I'm going to be talking about a case of a transgender man from Brisbane with my colleague Pam. And I'm Pam and like Dragan I'm a psychotherapist who works in the area of complex trauma and, and dissociation. Um, and I have a client in that area that I'm really looking forward to speaking to Dragan about and hearing about his client. Hey Pam, good to be here. Hey Dragan, good to catch up with you. Yeah. Hey look, I know you've got um, the case but I thought I'd just do a bit of a recap of what we're going to be talking about. Does that work for you? Yeah, sure. Just remind me. That'd be helpful. Thanks. Cool. Okay, so Dylan, um, he's a transgender man from Brisbane. Uh, he's 21 years old and his family are originally from India and he's been coming to therapy for about three months um, every week. And he's a fairly, um, he's sort of fairly agitated in his body, like he's quite fidgety. Um, he tends to kind of push his glasses up his nose a lot and jiggle a bit in the chair and stuff. But he's been working really well uh, with the regulation concepts around the window of tolerance and noticing that kind of hyper arousal in his body. That's been working quite well for him. Um, right. He's, yeah, he's um, come to therapy because he he's always been a meditator. He grew up meditating and he actually stopped it at one point um, a few years ago because he found that it was he he couldn't stop thinking about things that happened to him at school and stuff and they were really intruding and he he wanted to get back into it and it, basically the same thing has happened he's getting a lot of intrusions and a lot of sort of nightmares and and flooding from when he was at school uh he was 15 and he came out as trans and he got really bullied and physically bullied, um, psychologically trolling on social media, threatened in the hallways, and even actually um, sexually threatened in the boys' bathroom. So there's a lot of trauma around that time of his life. There's potentially other trauma as well that he's alluded to, but what happened when he tried to meditate again was that that all came basically flooding back into his awareness. So that's, he initially came to therapy to try and make that better for himself. He, he didn't understand what was going on. You know, he yeah, I've really... had a few clients like that. I've had it and they've really kind of spooked because they've heard meditation's really good for them and they try to do exactly. it and, and all this stuff comes up. So I hear what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, it, you know, it used to be a place that he he could sort of find peace and he could escape and it's just not that anymore. He's actually, it's actually brought up a lot more um, symptoms if you like for him around um you know feeling very startled and feeling he gets this feeling on a tingling on the back of his neck that um he feels like somebody's about to hit him and he'll just be walking down the road and and start getting the sensation so it's it's brought up a lot of what i would say would be ptsd symptoms for him mm. Mm. yeah and just remind me dragani he's in quite a good situation in terms of support at the moment he's he, you know in a supportive community but he's, he's got some concerns that his family um it's still quite difficult in terms of acceptance at that level is that right but he's got a lot of support in the here and now outside of yeah here. absolutely look he moved away from um he left school he moved away from the family situation up to brisbane he was in sydney and yeah that's yep. absolutely right he's he's in a good community he's feeling safe in that community he's got a little dog that he absolutely loves called milo and that's a real point of connection for him and mm. this yeah the main stuff that um he is estranged from his father and his mother and sister are not allowed to talk to him so he's only actually got an aunt who's connecting with them at all yeah yeah that's great that he's got support where he is now that it's, it's hard sometimes when the therapy relationship is the only one that's supportive but of course it's possible when that's the case but it's great if there's already good support outside of therapy so he's in that situation in his here and now kind of everyday life by the sound of it absolutely yeah and look he's he's um He's been doing well with what I guess we would call more phase one work of, you know, safety and stabilization, regulation resources, um, 
he works well with that concept of the window of tolerance and where is he sitting right now. He's been doing well with that stuff. And mm. the reason we're talking about it today is that the last session, he he basically brought up his uncle and he, he, he sort of hinted at um, the fact that there'd been violence there and possibly sexual violence there. And then he completely shut down, stopped speaking, and a lot of work had to be done to basically bring him back from that state. So he really moved mm. into a a different state, yeah. Mm, 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 sure. Yeah. So the, one of the questions that's been put um, that we can discuss is, um, is it, the therapist was wondering, is it time to move into phase two? Is it too soon to move into phase two? That was one of the questions that came up about the stuff we'll be talking about today. Mm, sure. And that's a really always a difficult one because you're never quite sure, are you, even when all the signs are good? But I like to be really transparent around that. Do you think that would work? Like really working with the client. So what Dylan thinks and, you know, if he finds he's not, what what happens then? Has he got his grounding stuff? So it's kind of like a bit of a dance. And, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sort of absolutely. broken dance. So it's not like suddenly we're going to do it and it's all full on. It's like knowing you can step out at any time and it's a little bit exploratory. And if you get distressed, we just stop and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's not, I mean, you know, it's nice to have uh, the phased approach. I think it's a good model, but it's not an exact model. It's not a nice, neat one, two, three kind of model. You know, we start mm. with safety and stabilization. We move into processing trauma. We integrate. Oh, it's all over. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like that, of course. And I think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. The information for me from um, from this is that, you know, yes, it probably is too soon to move into phase two however um, he did regulate back you know in that session he did regulate back they were able to come back to that place of safety and grounding and I'd be I guess I'd be curious about um, yeah like you say testing it out like if he brought it say in the next session or another session and he wanted to talk about it it would be okay let's see how we go we can we can stop. We can come back to um, safety mm. again. We can. There are lots of things we can do to make this a safe experience for you. Yeah, and is he on board with that? You know, the dissociative sort of stuff as as protective and like he's if he's feeling overwhelmed, he, his body will give him sign. He'll kind of tune out or get distressed. So he knows the function that that's serving. And that it can be yep. managed. If that comes up, you can manage it. Because I, I find a lot of my clients, I really like to spend a lot of time because people can freak out. What if I get upset? What if I get upset? Whereas if they kind of know. Exactly. Well, yep. We do get upset with distressing things, but we can manage it, you know, that kind of dynamic. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 got a lot of knowledge now around, you know, the the function of his nervous system and what's happening. He tends to go more towards the hyper arousal, like he tends to go more into the agitated state. Um, right. And when he freezes, he, he tends to go more into that, um, I would call it an active freeze as opposed to the full shutdown collapsed freeze. Like he, he mm. he's not moving, but he's, he's also not in that, you know, that collapsed state that's very, very dissociative mm -hmm. and very sort of passive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, he he seems to be much more on the the hyper alert state, even if he's shut down. Yeah, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and it's yeah. so important, isn't it, that we as therapists recognise that somebody, you know, like you say, it's not necessarily a full shutdown, but people can still be overwhelmed, even if they're not totally zoned out. They can stop, and we might think, oh, they're just hesitating or taking a moment, but it could actually be a really distressed semi kind of shut down so being really gentle yeah. and as we're saying reassuring around that yeah 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 um one of the things that um comes up for me i think with with his case is that yes he's transgender and he does have the potential for um say gender incongruence um i would call it gender incongruence where he can experience a dissonance between his gender identity and how he's feeling in his body or how he's feeling even about his body. He does have the potential mm. for that still. He can still feel quite uncomfortable in his body. But I feel like I work very much with what's in the room and I really feel like, you know, yes, his gender's in the room because he's in the room, he's a trans man, but his gender isn't an issue in the room at this time. Mm, mm, mm. I think that's a great point. Thank you for, because it's so easy to, for a, 
you know, a therapist who's, who doesn't work a lot with transgender clients to think, oh, everything's about the transgender issue, you know. If something yeah, comes yeah. up, it's something to do with a transgender identity. Whereas you say, this is a human being in distress and that, that's the primary thing in working in the room. So thanks for just clarifying, reminding me about that. That's great, yeah. Yeah. Look, I think, um, you know, for me, I would be, you know, yep, he's a trans guy. So I'd be aware of my language. I'd be keeping my language nice and open. Um, I'd use gender neutral language as much as possible. Um, I'd use, you know, quite open concepts around. I wouldn't be um, describing behaviours or activities or even reactions using sort of masculine or feminine, like those sorts of concepts. I'd keep it much more open. Mm. Uh, and yep. I'd be aware of if I got that wrong for him, you know, I'd, I'd sort of have to be attuned to that or even ask questions mm. if I wasn't sure. Um, yep. But other yep. than that, that's, that's for me, that's just, you know, there's often diversity in the room and we're often trying to be as competent as we can with that around, okay, how do I meet this person relationally in a safe way for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. would you articulate that too, Dylan, and... and welcome him specifically verbally say look please jump in and I don't mean just around transgender and pronouns but if there's anything at all that you know is, is uncomfortable or perhaps I've got something wrong and I obviously I didn't intend to but feel free to kind of tell me would you actually put it out to him like that yeah definitely definitely I love actually I yeah. love um I know we all, we get very languagey around our therapeutic approaches and stuff but I actually love Pat Ogden's concept of contact statements like I yeah. you know yeah, I really, yeah, yeah, yeah. it really resonates with me that thing of what's there and that if something goes awry then I have to make contact with that like oh mm. that didn't go down so well I, I'm sorry yeah, I, I yeah, did yeah. that wrong you know yeah 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 absolutely yeah yeah rather than pretending um, and, and going on as if nothing's happened if we sense a discomfort in, in, in either of us being able to somehow address that and acknowledge it whether verbally or not rather than just going on as if it hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, the only place I really, I think, I'd want to just keep an awareness around the gender stuff, I don't feel like it's in the room as an issue, but, I, but it is in the room. Um, and my awareness would be around working somatically. And again, I'd just be attuned. I'd have to be attuned to, if we're working somatically and we're working with the body, is that something that's easy for him or not easy for him? Um, can he come into his body or not come into his body? But that for me would be similar if you're working with someone with trauma around sexual abuse, for example, you might still come up against the same sort of issues around how easy is it for someone to access concepts around the body. Mm, 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 absolutely yeah mm. so high sensitivity but an issue for whatever any client that's that's an issue isn't it about attuning to the body and safe ways to draw attention to it that aren't going to freak the person out so yeah, yeah totally and and you know I, I do work in a way where I want people to be able to jump in and I think initially that's quite a hard thing for, for particularly trauma mm -hmm. survivors to be able to do that but it's a great place you can get to therapeutically when someone can actually say no that's wrong for me um, because yep. now we've we've really built some empowerment that someone's able to say to the apparent authority in the room as the therapist and they're able to yeah, yeah, yeah. disagree yeah, absolutely yeah and I think that's such yeah. an important point because obviously van der Kolk talks about befriending sensations you know but it's so hard when the sensations are distressing isn't it so people yeah. can, you know, if we're trying to take them quickly and talk about attunement to the body, and the body can actually be very triggering. It can be the site of the trauma, you know, especially exactly, around sexual yeah. trauma and probably with Dylan some dysmorphia, like you're saying. So yeah. attuning to sensations but um, being very aware that that in itself is potentially really destabilising for someone. Um, so the way in which we do it being just so important, yeah. And, the, I mean, you'd notice, wouldn't you, you'd see... You'd see shifts in their posture. You'd see shifts in their regulation state. You'd be like, oh, this isn't really working for them. I have to be curious as to why it's not working. Um, I mean, with someone like Dylan, probably before this point, well, I would say well before this point, I would have figured out what language works for you around your body, you know, um, mm -hmm. to get some of that information. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think, where we're all stepping up, you know, we talking therapy people because the body's so important and most of us haven't had that 
body awareness in our trainings and we're listening to the words but if we do notice you know someone kind of you know moving in the seat or, or looking to the side suddenly or, or fleetingly looking distressed we don't just ignore that's really important information for us isn't it whereas if we just go on yeah. the words we're, we're leaving all that out yeah yeah I think yeah and I think for me where he is right now I'd be so he's brought something up it's been too much it's shut him down I would probably back off from it um, and be re-resourcing but it wouldn't mean I wouldn't be if he brought it you know I'm not going to be um, I'm going to follow his lead around that but um, I'd, I'd maybe be trying to find ways to so instead of bringing it and him having to relive it you could externalize it in some way so if he wants mm. to look at that a way that it can be a little bit distant from him where he can start looking at it not as something he's having to re-experience through telling about it but through something he can start putting it over there so to speak mm. to start looking at mm. it. yeah sure yeah and just getting back to what you said before about the meditation something he's tried and can sometimes kind of be stabilizing would you be kind of distinguishing between meditating and, and like just noticing rather than really trying to focus because mindfulness and meditation aren't the same are they a lot of people kind of exactly. link them, but we're yeah. wanting people to notice rather than kind of focus in a meditation type way if they're yeah. not regulated. And I would say where he is at right now, um, the note, the concept of noticing would be really useful for him. So even you could talk about the last session. So when that happened and what, if you look at it now, um, what happened for you in your body when that, what did it feel like when you stopped speaking and I saw your head go down and you were looking at the floor and, you know, so he can even start noticing that as a, it's like making it a story in a way, isn't it? I'm looking at it from here. Mm. It's me, mm. but I'm looking at it from mm. here. So I don't have to be overwhelmed by it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I always think of um, Janina Fisher and other, like the curiosity. When something's painful or distressing that we notice about ourselves, it, you know, obviously that's usually not a good feeling. But if we can encourage people to be curious, you know, it, the, the, the body's always a source of information and if we yeah. can you know it's hard when the information it's giving is painful but if we can keep up that oh, it's interesting that my body's actually I'm, I'm like you said before with phase one and phase two Dylan might be think he's ready for phase two and then he gets distressed and rather than kind of going into that if he's able to kind of, oh that's interesting my body's actually suggesting I'm perhaps not as ready as I thought or trying to see it as yep. valuable information even if it's you know, distressing in, in the moment that can take the edge off. And if we can somehow try and keep that curiosity up, as hard as it is to do that. Yeah, and I mean, I do. You know, I do work a lot with the body, so I I I would use something like um, if he was wanting to explore that, I might be like, tr I'd be trying to find a way for him to put it out there to look at it. I mean, one thing um, I've done is you know, you draw a little outline of the body and then you start talking about sensations and start finding out, um, particularly around his um, gender incongruence or his dysphoria. Um, so if we coloured the body green, you know, areas that you feel really okay about and maybe we coloured, you know, red or whatever colour um, areas that you don't feel okay about, like you're starting to get to know that information mm. and then you can because you're trying to bring something from the external to the internal. So then it could be, okay, so if you put your hand on a part of your body where you've colored it green, how is that to have your mm. hand on that part of your body? And you start exploring the inner and mm. the outer. Yeah. 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 That's really, yeah. Lots, lots of ways of, I like that visualizing and, and the color and that sort of externalizing and, a manageable way of addressing sensations that can be really confusing in the moment, but addressing it in that way can kind of make it a bit, um, a bit more user friendly, I guess, a bit encouraging to sort of get into yeah. all that. Yeah. Mm. And you're you're doing it, you know, bit by bit, or using Peter Levine's idea of titration. You know, even if it's too much to put your hand on a part of your body where you've coloured it red, but you could put it near an area that you've coloured it red, yes. and you could explore what that was like and you know you move towards yeah. things you move away from them it's it's it really makes sense to me that whole rhythm of you know you move towards something that's stressful but you don't move yeah, too far yeah. so, so that you're overwhelmed you come back to your place of resource yep absolutely that ebb and flow thing I was and and just on that around the um 
you know, edging up to stuff into phase two and, and you know, exposure. Did you want to, that's always interesting to connect on, isn't it? Because there are exposure therapies that um, often aren't as recommended for, for complex trauma people and there can be some confusion around that. And do we want to say something around that? I just want to get your sense of, of that. I think the titration you mentioned is a safe way that's probably our guide like exposure can often mean like confrontation or taking yeah, yeah. straight into things whereas the titration fits with the phase model for complex trauma it, it's gentle it's moving towards but it's not like a full-on exposure in the way that perhaps stand exposure therapies potentially can be yeah it's interesting because it did come up in the training where somebody i was describing the titration um, technique of moving, you know, towards and moving back to your place of resource. And somebody said, isn't that like exposure therapy? And I said, oh, that's a great question. And we talked about it <laughs> as a group, you know, because it's not, of course, it's not the same as exposure therapy, but it is building your resilience to that sensation or to that event, or you are building resilience. Yeah, I think Christine Courtois, does she talk about approaching rather than avoiding? You know, we're, it's like proximity, isn't it? And I think Levine yeah. talks about, as you said, indirectly. I think, doesn't he talk about that, you know, that Greek myth? And um, is it is it Perseus with the, with the shield? Medusa and his advice, to, like he, the shield, you don't look directly into the heart of the trauma like looking at Medusa, yep. you do it indirectly. So exposure is kind of that confrontation, immersion, full on, whereas we're saying... You know, you can edge up to something. Obviously, you can't avoid painful things all your life, but you can start to move towards it, like you're saying, safely with pendulation and titration rather than exposure, capital E, full-on immersion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And there's so many, you know, we've got wonderful modalities to be able to do that, you know, ways that you can, you know, edge up to it or you can do it symbolically or metaphorically or you know or mm. even just you know through the body using sensation in the body there's so many ways we can move towards yeah. and and as you move more into phase two which I think is too too far for Dylan right now but as you moved on you know I imagine um, you know I like that concept of Pat Ogden's that you're working at the edges of the window of tolerance you're mm, mm, mm. you know you're you're extending resilience and it might be uncomfortable but you learn to sit in discomfort you learn to sit with the level of stress without becoming overwhelmed yeah yeah but i think that's really important because a lot of people who are struggling and you know with trauma they kind of think oh you know if i go and see a therapist it's about talking about it's about confronting and we're very much aren't we with complex trauma so it's not not about that it, it is gentle it is being resourced before you go there and if and if you do go there and you get unsettled you go back to the resourcing so that gentle yeah. kind of in and out ebb and flow it, it'd be awful if people were thinking oh they can't see a therapist because they're going to be forced to talk about it or forced to confront stuff whereas as we're saying, complex trauma therapy, the phase to approach is not about that at all. Yeah, yeah. Look, another thing that came to mind, I wanted to see your take on this. I was really interested because he does, he does um, relate to sensations in his body. Like he describes the churning in the stomach. He describes this tingling on the back of his neck. And I was really curious about, um, because I also know that he has the potential for gender incongruence. I was wondering about a way to tease out the difference that the churning in his stomach and the tingling on the back of his neck where he feels like he's going to be struck actually he mm. could he's put that all into the same boat of this is my gender incongruence but I actually think those are PTSD symptoms I don't think they're about his gender at all I think they're about his trauma mm. Mm. well yeah is that something you would draw you know have a conversation with him about or you feel he's not quite ready to make that distinction or Sounds like a. I think I'd. I think I'd explore it maybe at this. If he yeah. again, if if he brings it, you know, if he says, "Oh, my stomach's churning," I think I'd explore it um, because I think it's important to differentiate the difference. You know, we everything isn't everything in the body isn't just about, for example, that I'm dysphoric. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. It, but I mean, absolutely. Oh, you go. Yeah. Absolutely. 
No, I was just going to say, I think that's who I can't remember who which therapist says it, but never taking at face value what a particular word is, a description is. Someone might say, oh, I feel terrible or I have tingling or, and oh, you know, what, what what's that like? Because that description could be very different for everybody and including for the person, the tingling in one context might be something somewhere else. So teasing out what that experience is actually like. Yes, and like you say, yes. in the course of that, he may well, do, oh, it's actually, it's not what I thought initially, or it can be different at different times. And just give a bit more room to move because there's such a tendency to over-identify with a painful sensation. It's like it's all bad kind of thing, you know, or it's all about this. Whereas if you break it down like that and, you know, explore those, what's it actually like, you can sometimes make helpful distinctions that or people can help you know, that can help them tolerate it better or get a different take on it or, yeah, it makes sense. Well, I think it's important, isn't it, because people are uh, often coming to us with a diagnosis um, or a variety of diagnoses um, and that becomes a blanket thing. Oh, I'm I'm dysphoric, I have gender incongruence, I am um, I have borderline or I am a borderline uh, you know, personality disordered person or, you know, people claim that as an mm, identity mm. and part mm. of our work is like, well, actually, yeah, let's tease this out. You know, what is this actually about? What if it's a trauma response? What if it's actually yeah, your yeah, body yeah. reacting to something that's happened um, in the past? What if it's that? What if it's not what you've been told it is? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So some gentle kind of psych ed around that too, not in a kind of teachy way, but a lot of people, yes. you know, these are these are the responses when we're just, this is how the body works, how the brain under stress. It's like, oh, it's not just me or it, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not my disorder or whatever. These are responses that human beings have to distress on. Yeah, yeah. I find that works really well often as well, yeah. Yeah. Would you, where, where are you thinking um, he's sitting for yourself? Like a, for just before we sort of wrap up, um, what, where are you, how is it working for you as far as what you think you'd be doing with something like him, somebody like him? Sure, yeah, well, I, I guess I'd be, like you were saying, a little bit unsure. Which, and I, when I feel like that, which is quite a lot, like is someone ready for the next stage? Are they not ready? I think we never know that for sure. I'd probably be tempted to really have a conversation with you. You know, can we take stock, Dylan? You know, we've met for a, a while and I know you're kind of thinking at times you want to address this stuff and other stuff comes in. You're not sure if you're ready and can we have a conversation about that and really kind of enlist it as a, as a partnership because I don't think mm. we ever are quite sure about that and putting it out there and trying to have a collegial conversation and then okay you know maybe we'll try it maybe we won't what do you think and and if we do and, and if there's distress what will we do so it becomes a kind of you know potential consolidation of the resourcing and, and what the format will be and, and and that kind of thing rather than um yeah you can go well, then it's a, it's around a, and yeah sorry it's a co-journey then isn't it like it's a um, it's a collaboration together. Like, if this should become too much, what are what are you going to do? What are we going to do? I don't know all the answers. Teasing out their own answers, you know, for him to say yeah, actually yeah. that was too much last time, you know, for him to be yep. able to identify, yeah, my body shut down. Okay, that tells me it was too much. So how do we work with that going forward? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and back to your point about the stages aren't rigid. It's and, you know a lot of people think, oh, that's phase one out of the way. Oh, now I'm into phase two. But it's often with phase two, no matter how resourced a person is. I mean, this is trauma often with clients, isn't it? No matter how resourced mm. you are, you're, you're potentially going to be quite distressed. So it's not a matter of just barreling on. It's like if the distress comes up, we stop. We go back to the phase one resourcing. And I think you know that often really reassures people, doesn't it? That it's not this sudden. Okay, we're ready for phase two. White knuckling, getting through it. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, okay, maybe we can start it in an exploratory way. If we get to stuck and go back and do such and such, and it becomes a bit more manageable rather than this big spooky transition. Yeah, and it is a flow, isn't it? Like we are organic beings. Um, it is a flow, and sometimes we think we're mm. well down our therapeutic path, path, and then something else comes up, and we're like, oh, I need to go back to that early stuff that I did. I need to get back to that place of solidity in myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So 
So hopefully it sounds like you've got a good therapeutic rapport with him and you can have that com- kind of conversation. Um, and he's, you know, so we're not we're not the experts in that way. We've, we've got some, you know, resources, some ideas and we're going to assist, but we're really interested, um, yeah, what he feels himself and how best to support him. And if, if he gets distressed, we can go back to and all that kind of thing. So it's very... Um, yeah, very conversational and exploratory rather than yeah. suddenly we're into it kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Well, look, I've got to get off, but thank you so much. It's been great just having a chat about it and um, sharing oh, great ideas. Great for me too. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. We have to catch up more often, Dragan. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's nice. I feel like, you know, we, we're we going to approach things in our own ways, but we have a really sort of similar we're on the same page around these these are the best practice approaches to working with complex trauma so that we don't overwhelm people and so that we are working from a place of strength and resilience and not working from a place of deficit and people getting so overwhelmed and flooded. Absolutely. It's really good to touch base on that all that. Thanks, Dragan. Till next Tina time. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks. I'll see you later. Bye. 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 Bye.